right. um, so we're going to be in Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 1, um, continuing on with our study here um, in the book of Colossians. Um, really appreciate uh, Jeff and Jessica again leading us there in music. Um, really appreciate all they do, and uh, yeah, that was, that was good. Um, it's amazing to just know and think about how good God is to us and, and how much he loves us. And um, I know we've been talking about here in Colossians about his, his role in our lives and how that makes him preeminent, how he's our, our savior. He saved us from darkness and from sin and from death, and, and he's our creator, and all things were created for him and by him, and he holds all things together, and, and he's our, uh, our head, our leader, the head of the church, um, and we follow him because he loves us and he cares for us so much, and um, we now have peace with God also through his act of reconciliation, um, the idea that we were, we were alienated from God, we were sinners, we pushed God away, we blamed God for our sin, even though the rift in the relationship was our fault, and yet Jesus Christ loved us so much that he came and died on the cross um, to, to reconcile us to him. It's just, just an amazing, amazing thing to think about, and it's been a, a great study here in Colossians as, we, as we've gone through this to talk about Paul's arguments that he laid out here for this church for the preeminence of Christ. And so we see that he's built this case that Jesus Christ is indeed preeminent. He's superior. He's all we need. He's our all in all. He's, he's, he's really everything because he's created us. He's saved us. He's, he, he leads us. He loves us. He's reconciled us to himself. And so therefore he, he is indeed uh, preeminent. And so far here in this letter, Paul is rightfully focused on Jesus Christ. And that's where we want to put our focus. We want to put all our focus on him, make everything about him and, and what he's done for us and who he is. However, at this point now, Paul is going to kind of churn the page a little bit and start to talk about himself just, just a little bit, even though he's been focusing on Christ. So something we need to remember is this book here in Colossians that, that Paul wrote. He wrote this letter to the church at Colossae, and this church has never met Paul. Okay, they've never seen him. They've never met him. The church was started out of one of his ministries. So Paul was a missionary, um, and he went to a region called Ephesus, a city called Ephesus, and he planted a church there. He, he gave the gospel there, and, and the gospel just spread throughout that region from his ministry. But this specific city here in Colossae, um, this church was started by somebody else um, as a as a um, I don't know, a, a grandchild, if you will, of Paul's ministry. But Paul has never visited this church or has never, has never seen this church. Now, can you imagine, another thing to think about is that Paul was in prison when this letter was written. So he was in prison, most likely in Rome at this time, and he wrote it as a prisoner um, there in Rome. Now, can you imagine receiving a letter from somebody you've never met, you've heard about him, you know about him, but you've never met him, and he's in prison, and he wrote this letter talking about all kinds of things that have to do with religion and faith and things like that. Um, it's most likely, most scholars believe that the false teachers here in this church were trying to discredit Paul. They were trying to make people mistrust him, you know, say, okay, he's a, he's a prisoner. Um, obviously, you don't want to listen to this guy. He did something wrong. He did something worthy to be thrown into to prison for. Um, and so you don't need to listen to Paul and all his nonsense about Christ and the gospel. You, know, you need to listen to us and, and, and we tell you how you can get uh, spirituality by, by, you know, these different uh, beliefs and, and, and religions and, and philosophies that have nothing to do with Christ. Um, you need to listen to us and not to him. And so Paul here is going to take the next few verses and talk a little bit about himself. Um, and what he's doing is he's taking the opportunity to show that he is practicing what he preaches. So Paul's like, listen, Jesus Christ is preeminent. He is above all. He's supreme. He's all we need. And listen, I am applying that to my own life as well. Listen, this is how his preeminence applies to me, and it can also um, apply to you. So as we read these verses, there's a couple things that we need to think about um, how this is going to be helpful to us. First of all, Paul wants to show the church here that he can be trusted and they can listen to him. And so us, when we evaluate servants of Christ, right, people that we listen to, people that we hear, people that we follow, whether they're preachers or teachers or YouTubers or podcasters or whatever it is, we can evaluate them based on the principles that Paul gives us here in, in, in the passage. He, he's going to show us what a true servant of the gospel looks like. And so if you like to listen to somebody just because you think they're cool or you think they sound good or whatever it is, but they're not measuring up to what Paul writes here, then maybe they're not somebody we should be uh, giving our time and attention to. And then secondly, we can evaluate ourselves. 
based off of what Paul gives us here in this passage. I would imagine most of us in this room probably would want to consider ourselves a servant of the gospel. They would want to consider ourselves a follower of Christ. Now, I know we're not all going to be, you know, none of us are going to be apostles. We're not all going to be evangelists or, 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 or pre preachers or pastors or whatever. But if we want to be a servant of Christ and a, and a servant of the gospel, then what would that look like in our own lives? So let's go ahead and read this passage um, and let's see what Paul uh, has to say about himself here um, and about how he considers himself to be a servant of the gospel and a follower of Christ and what that looks like. So we're going to read Colossians chapter 1. Um, and we're going to read verses 23, and we're going to go into chapter 2 a little bit, uh, read down through verse 3 in chapter 2. So Paul writes here, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ and you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let's pray. Father, Lord, just uh, thank you again for this time together. Lord, thank you for this church, for these people, for your love, for your gospel, for your uh, just for who you are and what you've done for us. And Lord, I pray that this morning that you would just help us to learn and grow from your word, help us to understand what it is to be a, a minister of the gospel and a, and a follower of you. And Lord, help us to um, just, I don't know, just be willing to deny ourselves here this morning and, and follow after you and live for you and love you. And um, Lord, help me to be clear. Um, give me the words to speak. And, and I pray you just move me out of the way here this morning and just let your word speak and um, that we would learn and grow from it. Learn to love you more and love each other more. And um, yeah, just thank you for the good things that have happened so far here this morning and for the opportunity to worship you in song and in music and uh, just to lift up your name and Lord, thank you for the opportunity to, to baptize um, some believers here this afternoon as they follow you and um, obey you. And, and, and Lord, I just pray that you just help us as a church to continue to follow you and live for you, to, to spread your gospel, to rejoice in suffering, and um, Lord, to um, just strive and labor for you. Um, and Lord, just give us the, the, the grace to do that here this morning and the wisdom. And we love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in our passage, we see Paul declare himself to be a servant of the gospel, where he called himself a minister. This word minister means, means servant. Um, and Paul is declaring himself to be a servant of the gospel. Now, the gospel, um, I think most of us in here would, would kind of have a good understanding of what that means. But just to, to, to define it so we know, um, you know what we're talking about here, the gospel is the good news of of Jesus Christ. Like Paul just laid out in the previous verses, right? Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the son of God. He's the creator. He is God and he's created all things. And not only did he create all things, but he's reconciled us to himself through his death on the cross. So we rejected him because of our sin. And yet he, he, he died on the cross to pay for our sins. And then he rose again from the dead. And, and now we can put our faith and trust in him and, and be called his, his children, be part of his inheritance, part of his kingdom. Um, and so he rose from the dead and we're going to follow him in, in resurrection uh, one day. And he's going to you know, have his kingdom and, 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 and we get to inherit eternal life because of what he has done, uh, what he has done for us. And so Paul has said this idea, this gospel, this good news um, that we get to proclaim about the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done for us, 
Paul is calling himself a servant of that gospel, a servant of that good news. Now, listen, if there's anything that we're gonna, uh, uh, we would find worthy of dedicating our lives to, anything that we would find worthy of being a servant of or worthy of dedicating so much time and energy to, I mean, I would think that the incredible, amazing truth of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us would be uh, something that is worthy of dedicating ourselves to, to becoming a servant of. And so I would imagine, again, that we would all would like to consider ourselves servants of the gospel this morning. But Paul goes ahead and, and tells us what that looks like. What does a servant of the gospel look like? And he gives us three things in our passage here that show us that he was indeed a servant of the gospel and how we, too, can serve Christ and serve his gospel. So the first thing that Paul says here is that, or, or that we see from Paul and from his life is that he shared the gospel. Paul shared the the gospel. So this church here in Colossae, Paul told them, listen, you've heard the gospel because it was preached to you, right? He said that in verse 23. He's talking about the faith and, and being grounded and settled and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, and made a minister. So Paul's like, listen, this gospel was, was preached to you. It was given to you. You have heard it, and I'm a servant of it, and I've been, you know, I've been sharing the gospel. Now, we know it wasn't Paul who, who personally preached to the Colossians. Paul isn't the one who personally preached to this group of people here in Colossae, but they heard the gospel as a result of his ministry in Ephesus. So Paul went and preached in Ephesus and gave the gospel to them and turned that whole city upside down, and lots of people followed Christ because of his his word there, and this church, in, uh, this Colossian church, was born out of that. Well, God has chosen to use His people. This is how, what what God has chosen to do. He's chosen to use His people. He's chosen to use Christians. He's chosen to use those who who are are born again to spread His gospel. Um, he talks about that in, in Romans chapter ten. Um, Romans chapter ten, and uh, verse fourteen. It says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah, Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Paul there in, in Romans chapter 10 is explaining how Israel and the Gentiles, they're, they're saved by the same gospel. They put their, say, their faith in the same, you know, Jesus Christ and that gospel in order to, for them to call upon his name, in order for them to put their faith and trust in Jesus, they need to hear it and they need to believe it. But how can they hear it unless someone gives it to them, unless someone preaches it to them? And in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, um, Paul also here talks about how preaching is what God has chosen. God has been pleased to use to share uh, his, his good news. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. Um, Paul here also says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God. So it pleased God. And it was what God chose and wanted to do by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power, we preach Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So Paul's like, look, for those who put their faith and trust in, in, in Jesus, for those who are who are called for those who are saved, they uh, put their faith in him through the foolishness according to the world, right? The world thinks that, you know, preaching the gospel is foolishness. They think it's crazy, even though we know that that is true wisdom right there. Um, but through the foolishness of preaching, the gospel is how people put their faith and trust in, in Christ. And so this is what God has chosen to do. It's the method that he has chosen to utilize. Obviously, God could do whatever he wants. He could write something in the sky. He could make everyone believe if he wanted to. But but he has chosen through his infinite wisdom and sovereignty to use his people to share and to spread his gospel. And so Paul, as a servant of the gospel, he was all about sharing it with others. That's what he dedicated his life to. That's what he made his mission to be. And that is what he did all throughout his life after he was, he was saved. And so a large part, if you read the book of Acts um, and, and you read through it, a large part of that is, 
you'll see Paul traveling around, traveling to different countries, different nations, and sharing the gospel uh, with others and telling other people about the good news of Jesus Christ. He also reiterated it and talked about it in almost all of the epistles that he wrote. So his letters that he wrote to the churches that we have in our scriptures, Paul almost always uh, gave the gospel to them again. Even though he was writing to save people, he was writing to churches, he thought it was very important to make sure they understand and they know what the gospel is. I mean, he talked about it here in Colossians um, in, in verses 20 through 23, where he talked about reconciliation, right? Having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself um, and, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameable, unreprovable with it unreprovable in his sight. That is the gospel right there that Paul laid out for this church to make sure, listen, you understand what Jesus Christ has done for you. And the reason he was so adamant about sharing the gospel, the reason Paul was all about and so dedicated to sharing the gospel is because he was a true and an actual servant of the gospel. This word minister here in our passage literally means servant. Translates to servant. It's also the, the term we use for uh, deacon, um, deacon, servant, minister. All of that means this, it means the same thing. And, and, and what it means is literally someone who serves, someone who listens to and obeys the commands of another. And Paul felt as though he was a servant of the gospel who must obey the gospel, who should listen to and obey the gospel. Now, um, the idea of, of being a servant um, in, in this day and a servant in our day um, is a little bit different. Um, a lot of times during this time, someone who was a servant of another would uh, typically be like a debtor to them. Okay, so they'd owe, um, whether it's money or, or land or whatever it is that, that someone has given to them, they would then pay that off by working for, uh, working for the other person. And so Paul himself declared himself to be a debtor to the world to give them the gospel. We see this in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, Paul calls himself a debtor. Um, and verse 1 and verse 14. Um, Paul says here, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise so much, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Listen, Paul was like, I feel like I owe it to the world to give them the gospel. Right? I, I, I owe it to the world. I owe it to Christ. I owe it to, to everyone to give them and to share with them the gospel. After all, it is the power of, uh, of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. I mean, I have this great and amazing thing that is the gospel, and I have it, and it's been given, it, it's been given to me. And if I'm given this hope of the gospel, then why should I keep it to myself? Right? Why should I hoard it? Why should I selfishly hold on to it and not share it with others? Um, why, why should I not do that? No, I owe it. I am debtor to, to all of you. I'm debtor to, to the Gentiles. I'm debtor, debtor to the barbarians. I'm debtor to, to everyone to share the gospel. I owe it to you to share it with you. I mean, that would be very selfish of me. That would be very um, um, wrong of me to, to hold that and keep it to myself when I have this amazing, the most amazing truth that, that ever, ever was. And so Paul was a, a servant to the gospel. And listen, if we are to be servants of the gospel, we should be sharing the gospel. Right? We as Christians, we have this great hope. We have this great uh, a truth, the, the most amazing truth ever, where, where it's the power of God and the salvation, where our sins are forgiven, where we can uh, uh, receive eternal life from God. Why are we holding that to ourselves? If we, if we want to serve, serve Christ, we should be sharing the gospel. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this next week. I, I, I think um, next week we're going to focus in on verse 28, where Paul kind of tells us um, how he preaches the gospel, what the gospel looks like. And so maybe you're kind of wondering, okay, I want to share the gospel. I want to share it with people, but I'm not really sure how to go about it. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to say, um, what I'm supposed to do there. Uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit about that next week, um, where in verse 28, Paul says, 
um, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And so Paul's preaching the gospel always came with three elements. You can look at him preach in the book of Acts. You can look at him talk about it in his epistles. Whenever Paul talked about the gospel, there was typically three elements that came along with it. Warning of judgment, um, teaching of, of God's wisdom, whether that's going into the Old Testament with the Jews or talking about you know, the existence of God with the Greeks, whatever it is, teaching the wisdom of God. And then, of course, presenting Christ, presenting Christ. Those three elements were there. And I think we'll, we'll get into more details with that next week. But for now, um, suffice it to say that as a servant of the gospel, Paul was all about sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel. Next, we see him take that a step further as he tells us to be willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Or at least he tells them that he was willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Paul suffered for the gospel. So remember when Paul wrote this letter, he was in prison, okay? He was in prison. He was, you know, in prison because of his willingness to share the gospel. He was in prison because he was uh, speaking about Christ to others. And actually, more specifically, he was most likely in prison because he preached the gospel to the Gentiles, okay? So the, the Jews, um, in Acts chapter 22, um, the Jews took uh, uh, Paul and put him on trial, and they you know, didn't like what he had to say about Jesus. And so they put him on trial, gave him a chance to defend himself. Um, and then in verse 22 of Act, or 21 of Acts chapter 22, Paul, as Paul was defending himself, it says here, uh, he's, he's quoting Jesus. It says, and he said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. So Paul is telling this Jewish court here, hey, Jesus Christ has told me to go and give the gospel to the Gentiles, give the hope of God to the Gentiles. It's not just for us, but it's for the Gentiles as well. And then in verse 22, it says, And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. So what they did, they listened to him, they let him defend himself until he said, Listen, I'm going to take this gospel and give it to the Gentiles also because Jesus has told me to. At that point, they stopped, they stopped the trial, and they said, That's it. No, nope, you deserve to have whatever's coming to you. And so they took him and, and sent him over to the Romans and, and put him uh, put him in prison for for that. And so because of his preaching to the Gentiles, because of his being a missionary and a preacher to the Gentiles, he was put in prison. Now we know that Paul suffered a lot. Paul suffered a lot. He did not have an easy life. He had a very hard life, and he suffered a lot for the cause of the gospel. In fact, he gives us a whole list of things that he suffered in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, it almost sounds like he's, he's complaining. I don't think he is. I think he's just trying to make a point here to the Corinthian church, but um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse 23, he talks about all the different things that he went through for the cause of Christ. It says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. So he's talking about people who are ministers, servants of Christ. He's saying, I am a servant of Christ in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, and journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, and watchings often, in hunger and thirst, and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily. The care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? And so Paul was just laying out there all the different things that he suffered for the sake of the gospel, that he suffered for the cause of Christ. Listen, there's no guarantee in the Christian life that you will not suffer, that you will avoid suffering. In fact, it's pretty much promised to those who truly follow Christ. For those who, 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 are, who truly believe in him and truly follow him and, and are true servants of the gospel, it's basically promised to you that you will suffer for the cause of Christ. I mean, Paul probably had a pretty good life before, before he knew Christ, right? He was a, he was a Pharisee. He was, a, he was rich. He, um, you know, had a, had a lot of honor and things like that. And then he, he gave all that away for the cause of Christ and suffered so much for him. And listen, there's no guarantee in the Christian life that you will avoid suffering. 
But, so that's the bad news, but Paul here gives the good news and that he rejoiced in his suffering. He rejoiced in his suffering. We see that in verse 24 of Colossians chapter 1. He says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So Paul rejoiced in his suffering. He, he, he was able to find true joy despite what he was going through, despite the fact that he was writing this from prison, he was still able to rejoice in his sufferings. Now, there's a couple reasons why Paul was able to rejoice. First of all, he rejoiced in his suffering because he was suffering for Jesus Christ and he was suffering for Jesus Christ's body, which is the church. We see that in verse 25 where he says, or verse 24, I'm sorry, where he says, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, this can get kind of confusing. Maybe some of your translations say that he's um, completing the incomplete sufferings of Christ. Um, and, and, and it kind of almost seems like what Christ did on the cross was incomplete, and Paul is completing that. Um, that's, that's not what he's saying here at all. Paul is not talking about dying for anyone's sins. He's not talking about um, completing the salvific work that Jesus did on the cross. He's not saying that at all. The word afflictions here... Um, that's in verse 24, where he talks about the afflictions, that he's filling up the afflictions, uh, filling up that which is behind him, the afflictions of Christ. That word afflictions, that Greek word, uh, means pressures of life, and it was never used to refer to Christ's suffering on the cross. It was never used to refer to what Jesus did on the cross for us. We know all throughout Scripture that only Jesus could die for our sins, only the spotless Lamb of God could die and pay for our sins. And so it has nothing to do with our sins, nothing to do with uh, uh, Christ's sacrifice on on the cross. Um, if you want to get really literal with this translation, it literally means that Paul was filling up in his turn the leftover parts of Christ's suffering. So the sacrificial suffering of Christ on the cross is over, but we as Christians, we suffer because of our stand for the faith, right? Jesus said, if anyone's going to come after me, he needs to deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, we, we follow Christ into his suffering. Jesus Christ did not live an easy, cushy life here on earth. He suffered very much here on earth before he even went to, went to the cross. And, and he said, listen, if you're going to follow me, you got to take up your cross and you got to follow me through suffering as well. And we, the, the good news about that is we get to be complete in him by suffering with him as his body, the church, right? So the church is called Christ's body, right? We're, we're, we're his body. We know that he gave his body for the church, that he died for the church. And so we get to be complete in him. We get to fellowship with him. We get to be there alongside him through, through suffering. In fact, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, he called it the fellowship of, of suffering, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable on to his death right so as Christians we become we, we, we are conformed to the image of Christ we become more like Christ and we do so a uh, part of that is through through suffering through suffering for for him and we can rejoice in that suffering because Think about that. We Jesus Christ came to earth to suffer and to die for us. Right, the spotless, perfect uh, a son of son of God, the Lamb of God. He came and he suffered in, on the earth for us, and we get to fellowship with him. We get to take part in that by suffering alongside with him. And and the very fact that he died for us to to give his righteousness to us makes us worthy to suffer with him. And so it's, it's, it's a good thing. It's something that we're worthy to do. The apostles even thought this in Acts chapter 5. Um, in Acts chapter 5, the apostles were arrested and persecuted for preaching the gospel. Um, it was like Peter and John, if I remember correctly. Um, but in Acts chapter 5 and verse 41, when they were finally let go, it says, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And so they're like, man, this is awesome. We get to, we are worthy to suffer shame for Christ. That is something we can rejoice in, something we can, uh, we can delight in, something that is awesome that we're worthy to suffer for him. Now, Peter clarified this for us in 1 Peter chapter 4, that when we suffer for our own sin or even our own, you know, stupidity, 
um, we can't rejoice in that, okay? We can't be like, oh yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I did something wrong and I'm suffering. That must mean, you know, I'm, I'm a good Christian or whatever. No, we can't rejoice in that, but we can rejoice when we suffer for Christ. First Peter chapter four, verse 15 he says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer. Okay, those are really bad sins, right? Or as a busybody in other men's matters. Okay, so also being a busybody or gossiping or, or anything like that. If you suffer for that, that's kind of your own problem, uh, your own fault. But verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not. And by Christian, he doesn't mean just Christian in name only cause of the gospel. In Matthew chapter 5. It's giving us the Beatitudes here on the Sermon of the Mount. Um, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10, it says there's a special blessing for us for suffering for his cause, uh, for his sake. He says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So Jesus is like, listen, you're blessed. If you're persecuted, if you're rejected, if people falsely accuse you for my sake, you are blessed. And there's a special uh, special blessing and reward for you um, in, in, in heaven because of that. You're, you're just like, you know, and he gave an example, like just the prophets, right? The prophets throughout the whole Old Testament who were persecuted for, for declaring God's word. They suffered for declaring God's word. And yet they look back and they think that the prophets are great. They lift them up. They honor them, right? Well, we can be counted worthy to suffer with Christ. And that's, that's a good thing we can rejoice in. Paul also rejoiced in his suffering because the, good, the goodness of the gospel made it worth it, made it worth it to him. Think about it in your own life. What are, what are some things that you're willing to suffer for? Right? We, we exercise because we're, we're willing to go through that suffering in order to have better health. Some of us, you know, aren't big fans of our jobs, and yet we're willing to suffer, you know, the grind at work because, you know, we get, we get the paycheck. And so there's some things that are worth, worth suffering for. And Paul is saying here that he rejoices in suffering because of the awesomeness of the gospel makes it completely worth it, right? Where in verse 25, it said, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, this mystery um, that he's referring to here is the gospel. Okay, the word mystery, he would use it because it was used by some of the false teachers and by a lot of the religious people of the day um, to describe like the inner secrets of their religion, the inner secrets that only the inner circle could know, right? And so if you want to if you want to really um, um, be spiritual, you have to know our inner secrets, you have to know our mysteries um, in order to in order to be really spiritual, right? And only um, us really spiritual people can talk to angels or only us really spiritual people know what to uh, what kind of foods and things to avoid and things like that. And so you have to you have to solve the mystery in order to achieve righteousness or spirituality, right? And so Paul is saying, no, this mystery, this sacred secret is 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 the gospel. Um, it's the it's the gospel. It's the sacred secret that was hidden in the past. And is now revealed unto us. It's revealed to us. He gives us a little bit more detail in Ephesians chapter 3. Um, he's saying pretty much the same thing to the Ephesians, but um, with a little bit more detail. In Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Which, all right, so this is the mystery. He's describing it right here. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men and is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So he's like, this is a mystery because it wasn't known before, but it's now known now that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given unto me 
by the effectual working of his power. And so this is the mystery, that the Gentiles can be fellow heirs in the same body and partakers of the promise of Christ by the gospel. So before Christ, before Jesus came, God had called out the nation of Israel to be his people. And he gave them his law, he gave them their sacrifices, uh, he gave them the prophets, and he promised them that their Messiah would come and their king would come and that he would suffer and die for them, but then he would establish his kingdom, that he would save them. And, and all of this was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law and, and, and the prophets. All of it is found within him. And so the mystery is that God has now taken that, he's, he's, he's given us Christ, and he has now united Jews and Gentiles as his chosen people in the church. And so now we don't have to be a Jew, we don't have to uh, 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 be a proselyte, we don't have to follow after the law in order to, to get to God, in order to be saved. No, we're, we're now united in Jesus Christ because of what he has done uh, for us on the cross, right? So in the Old Testament, in order to be one of God's people, in order to take part in, in, in worshiping God, you had to become a, a Jew and, and be under Jewish law. But now what, what Paul is saying here in Colossians in verse 27, he's saying, now to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So now God has made known the riches of his glory. Now God has shown himself to us through Christ among the Gentiles. Now we can all have access to God and we can all be his people through Christ and through what Christ has done for us. And so this is awesome, wonderful, amazing news that, that God is not restricting us to, to the law, but no, he has, he has paid for our sins on the cross and now we have access to him. We have access to him through, through Christ. And that's such wonderful, awesome news that Paul is like, look, I want to share this with you guys. I want to let you know about this. I want you to see the riches of his glory. I want you to see the hope of glory. I want you to see Christ. I want to share this with you. And Paul is like, this is so awesome. This is so amazing that it is worth suffering for. It's worth going to prison over. It's worth hurting for. It's worth going through these hard things for to share that with others. And listen, if we as Christians, if we want to make Christ preeminent, if we want to say that he is superior, he's all we need, we want to make him preeminent, we want to consider ourselves servants of the gospel, then the bad news is we need to be willing to suffer for Christ. We need to be willing to, to be ashamed that we're declaring his name to others. We need to be willing to, thankfully here in America, it's not you know against the law to preach the gospel, but we need to be willing to preach the gospel regardless of you know, the consequences, and not only willing to suffer for him, but also to know that you can rejoice in that suffering, that we can find true joy in suffering for him because we get to take part in Christ's sufferings and because the hope of the gospel is just so incredible, so amazing that it is worth suffering for, it is worth suffering for. So Paul demonstrated that he was a servant of the gospel by sharing it and suffering for it. Lastly, we see him demonstrate his servants his service to the gospel and striving. So last point here, Paul's striving for the gospel. Here in verse uh, 29 and verse 1 of chapter 2, Paul describes his work for the Colossians and for the Gentiles and for the gospel. He describes it as labor and striving. He says, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. The words labor and striving and conflict, those are pretty strong words. And they imply hard work. They imply really hard work. Paul was willing to carry the heavy load to serve Christ by striving for the church. See, this word striving, the term striving and conflict are actually athletic terms. Paul liked to use his sports metaphors and his sports references. Um, and so when he was talking about striving and he was talking about conflict, he was using athletic terms here uh, to, to talk about like the strenuous effort that a runner um, exerts to win a race. Right? So, so if you've ever ran a race, if you've gone and ran a 5K or a half marathon or, 
or, or whatever it is, as you're running, then you know the effort and the pain that it takes that you have to push through to finish at your best, right? You wanna, you, if you wanna get a good time or you wanna win the race, right? You're gonna, you're gonna get a side stitch. You're gonna, your legs are gonna hurt. Your lungs are gonna feel like they're on fire. But what do you have to do? You have to push through that. You have to strive. You have to work. You have to continue going regardless of, of the pain and just keep exerting that effort in order to finish the race. And so that's what Paul was saying that he was doing. He's saying, I, I'm a servant of the gospel by striving and laboring. But what was he striving for? What was Paul striving for? Well, if we look at verses um, 1 and 2 of chapter 2, we see that Paul has great conflict. That he is competing and fighting for the church in Colossae and Laodicea and for the churches spread throughout the world that he hasn't had the chance to visit. And here's what he wants to do. He wants to strive for them. He wants to labor for them. And here's what's on his heart and mind. We see in verse 2, first of all, that their hearts might be comforted. So first of all, he wants to preach to them and encourage them in the word. Um, he wants to encourage them, to comfort them, to, uh, um, um, you know, to, to let them know that, yes, even though you're suffering for Christ, it is worth it. And he wants to comfort them um, and encourage them. Secondly, he talks about being knit together in love. And so he's striving and laboring for love and for unity. Okay, he's striving and laboring that the church would be unified and that they would have, have love. You know, and he talked about in Ephesians, I think it's chapter four, about how we endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace. And so love and unity is something we work for, something we strive for. It's not something that just happens on its own. It's something that requires work and that Paul was laboring and striving for. He's also striving for enrichment. So he said, um, here he said, and unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. So Paul is striving for their enrichment. And so as we learn, as we grow, and as we mature in Christ, we'll gain more understanding of the richness and, and, and his glory. And the more we learn about him, the more we love him, the more we understand the great things that he has done for us. And so Paul was striving for them to understand the, the, the richness of his glory then. And he's also striving for the wisdom and for the knowledge of others. Um, it says there, uh, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So he, listen, he wanted them to understand the mystery. He wanted them to understand the gospel. He wanted them to acknowledge it, to know it, to put their faith in it. And then he wanted them to understand how that relates to the Father and to Christ and how in God and in Christ, they're preeminent Christ is preeminent because in him is found all wisdom and all knowledge, right? The false teachers were like, you find wisdom in, in, in this philosophy. You will find wisdom in this religion. No, uh, Paul is saying all wisdom and all knowledge is found in Christ. He's everything that we need. As he was striving for them to know that, to know this. Now, what does this striving look like? Okay, what was Paul doing? How was he striving to do this for them? Well, he did a couple things for them. First of all, he prayed. He prayed for them. We see that at the beginning of chapter one, where, where Paul was saying that he, he was giving his greeting. And then he says in verse three, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. And then in verse nine, he says, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, etc." And so Paul prayed for them. He strove for them in prayer. And listen, prayer can be a labor. It can be hard. Um, it can be something that, that, that we, we find difficult to do. But, but Paul strove in that. He labored in that. He worked in prayer for, for others. He also preached, right? He had conflict that he couldn't be there with them, that he couldn't preach to them, that he couldn't uh, see them in person. And yet he went all over from nation to nation and, and preached the gospel and, and shared um, the wisdom of the gospel with others. And then he taught them through his letters. He encouraged them through his letters. He loved them through the letters that he wrote, uh, wrote to them. Listen, we, if we are servants of the gospel, we can strive for the sake of the gospel by working through Christ's body, the church, to pray, to preach, and to teach, to encourage, to lift up, to use our gifts to help each other to, to grow in the gospel and to help each other as we grow to go and share the gospel. And a Christian who is a servant of the gospel will, as Paul did, strive 
Strive for Christ's church to use their gifts to encourage, love, and enrich and teach others. Listen, though, those words striving and laboring, those are strong words, okay? Sometimes we think of church as like a, a Sunday thing that, that, that comes to us when it's convenient. It's something that, um, you know, when it's easy to do, we'll jump on board, we'll be involved. But Paul is saying here that a servant of the gospel is going to strive, they're going to labor, they're going to work hard, not just when it's convenient, not just when it's easy, but because Christ is preeminent, because he's everything to us, because he is our all in all, then we should be willing to give him our all in all. We should be willing to work hard and to strive and to labor for him, not for your pastor, not for, for others, but to labor for Christ. And, and labor for him and strive for him to, to use your gifts to build up the body, to encourage each other, to teach each other, to help each other, to love each other. So what does this all mean for you and for me? Okay, well, Paul here shows us what a servant of the gospel looks like. Being a servant of the gospel will manifest itself in sharing, suffering, and striving for the sake of the gospel. Being a servant of the gospel will manifest itself in sharing, suffering, and striving for the sake of the gospel. So there's two big applications for us here. Two big, two big applications for us as we walk away from this. First of all, Paul was trying to show the Colossians here that they can listen to him, that they can trust him, that they can believe him. And so we can use this criteria to evaluate the people you listen to, the people you follow when it comes to the faith. So do the people that you listen to and follow, do they share the gospel? Do they rejoice in suffering for the gospel? Right, I know a lot of these you know, people, on, well, I won't get too much into that, but a lot of people these days are not very um, joyful when it comes to suffering uh, for the gospel. They're very much how we can avoid suffering using politics instead of rejoicing in it and, and rejoicing in suffering for the gospel. And do the people you listen to and follow strive to help Christ's church? Do they labor in it? Do they strive for it? Or do you maybe follow and listen to people because you like the way they sound, the way they look, or some you know, other criteria? Also use this, like, if, listen, if you ever go to another church, okay, if you ever move um, or decide you don't like it here anymore or whatever, if you ever go to another church, Find one that shares the gospel where people rejoice in suffering and they're, they're striving, striving for the sake of the gospel. And even, listen, if you find me as your pastor, if you find me lacking in any of these areas, I, I mean this, I want you to correct me on it, um, tell me about it, correct me on it. I will try to be gracious about it. And if, ever, if it ever comes to, to it where I'm just like completely um, um, non-committal to the gospel and you need to find a new pastor who's going to be, you know, a true servant of the, of the gospel, then, then I would encourage you to do that. And evaluate yourself this morning. That's the other big application. Evaluate yourself this morning. Would you call yourself a servant of the gospel? Would you like to call yourself a servant of the gospel? Would you call yourself a follower of Christ? Well, are you sharing the gospel with others? You have this wonderful hope of Christ. You have the good news that has saved you from your sins. You have the answer to eternal life for crying out loud, right? And so are you selfishly hoarding that? Are you like, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to share it because I'm a little bit ashamed. I don't want to share it because I, I feel embarrassed. Um, or do you view yourself as Paul did as debtor, right? You're not ashamed to preach the gospel because you owe it to the world to share it with them. You owe it to others to share the gospel with them. You owe it to Christ to share him with others. Are you rejoicing in your suffering for him? I know most of us, probably including myself, tend to shy away from suffering for Christ because we're, we're ashamed, right? We don't want to face embarrassment. We don't want to lose our position at work. We don't want to lose our influence for others. And so we're, we're ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We will not rejoice in suffering for him. Or maybe we, uh, you know, politics aren't going the way we want them to. And we consider that persecution. But we can, we can look 
all across the world and see people who are truly suffering for Christ and, and people in these other countries who are, who are truly being persecuted for their, for their faith in Christ. And we can look at that and man say, I can rejoice. If that ever comes to that point, man, I can rejoice in that. I can, I can rejoice in suffering for him and be willing to suffer for him because, you know, I am a, a servant of the gospel and, 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 and we can, Understanding that it's worth it. It's so worth it to suffer for the cause of, of Christ because he's given us everything. He's given us everything through the gospel. And we can suffer with him. And we'd be counted worthy to suffer with him. And then lastly, are you striving to serve Christ? Are you striving to serve Christ in his body, the church? Are you laboring, laboring to encourage, to love, to enrich to share, to teach? Or do you maybe just come expecting others to do all that for you? Now, don't take this the wrong way, but I wouldn't call myself a follower of Christ. I wouldn't call myself a servant of the gospel if his body... It's just all about what I get out of it. It has nothing to do with what I put into it. And you can be saved. You can certainly be a Christian. But Paul was saying, I'm a minister of the gospel because I'm striving and I'm laboring for his work, his work which, work which worketh in me mightily. Now again, we're not all going to be pastors and, and teachers and deacons and and things like that. But you can use your gifts for Christ. And not just use your gifts for him, but labor and strive in, in that and be a servant of the gospel. So being a servant of the gospel will manifest itself in sharing, suffering, and striving for the sake of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, Lord, just thank you again for this time together, for your love, uh, for, for who you are, for what you've done. Lord, I pray that you just... Um, Help us these next few moments to just uh, reflect on your word. Lord, thank you for giving us Paul and for inspiring him to write these letters and for us to just sh to show how he is your follower, your servant, minister of your gospel. Lord, I pray that we could be more, more like him, not just more like him, but definitely more like you, Christ, and, and, and be conformed to your image and become more like you. Lord, I pray that you just stir up in our hearts the, the, the grace that we need to share your word and to suffer for it and to, um, to live for you and to strive for you, Lord. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that maybe doesn't know you, they haven't put their faith and trust in you, they haven't understood what you have done for them on the cross, Lord, I pray that they would come to know you here this morning. We love you and just thank you so much for all that you've done. I pray these things in Jesus' name.